exercise 5.3, learning objective number three. And this will be our first look at calculating a predetermined overhead rate, so let's take it slow. Compute the predetermined overhead rate. Logan Products computes its predetermined overhead rate annually on the basis of direct labor hours. That's important. That's our activity driver, direct labor hours. At the beginning of the year, it is estimated the total manufacturing overhead would be 586,000, and the total direct labor would be 40,000 hours. And then we're given actual numbers of 713.4 for overhead and 41,000 for direct labor. Require compute the company's predetermined overhead rate for the year, calculate the total overhead applied, and determine the amount of under or over applied overhead for the year. So we're being asked for three things in one statement. So remember how to do this. Step number one. Step number one in, in, in this process, there are th this is a three-step process. If you remember these three steps, you'll never, you'll never uh, uh, have a struggle with these questions. So step number one, we're dealing with estimates. Estimates only of manufacturing overhead and whatever our activity driver is. Here we're told it's direct labor hours, so we want an estimate of direct labor hours. So estimates, this is the important thing right here. Keep in mind that we're only dealing with estimates to get the, 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 the predetermined overhead rate. So this equals, we're told, our estimates was $586,000 and we're told 40,000 hours. And that'll give us $14.65. And it's important to say this, $14.65 per direct labor hour. Whatever the activity driver is, that's what the per is. So whatever number we get, per whatever the numerator was, direct labor hours. All right? So this is our predetermined overhead rate. That's step one. Let's move on to step two. Step number two is we take our predetermined overhead rate that we calculated and we multiply it by the actual direct labor hours or whatever the activity driver is, we multiply it by the actual. So we get 1465. I should say that once we leave step one, once we have this, this over here, once we have this, we no longer need these estimates. You no longer need them. Ignore them. They'll only get you in trouble if you use them again. The estimates are only useful for calculating the, the predetermined overhead rate. Once we have that rate, these are just is just useless information that could hurt you if you try to include it somewhere else. So we take the 1465 times the actual hours. Remember, this 40,000 is our estimate. We want the actual now. And we're told that the actual was 41,000. Multiply that by 41,000. This is 600,500. Sorry, 600,650. I wasn't paying attention then. This is called applied overhead. This is what we applied. Applied manufacturing overhead is 600,650. So step number three, the final step in all this, is to take actual, actual manufacturing overhead minus the applied manufacturing overhead to figure out if we're over or under. So our actual manufacturing overhead was 713,400 minus what we applied was 600,650. That equals 112,750. So since actual, and this is where you gotta use some logic, since actual was greater than applied, in other words, what we applied to all the jobs was less than what we actually incurred, since actual is greater than applied, when we do actual minus applied, it will be greater than zero, and it is greater than zero. Therefore, we have under applied. We have under applied by that total, 112,000. 750. So let me go through this logic again. Step one, we use estimates. We get the, the predetermined overhead rate. We no longer need the estimates. You can ignore them. Step number two, we take the predetermined overhead rate, multiply by the actual cost driver to get what we applied, our applied overhead. 
Step three, we take our actual manufacturing overhead, subtract our applied overhead, and see what we get. If it's greater than zero, it must mean that actual was greater than apply, which means we actually incurred more costs than what we charged to job. So we have to charge this somehow. We've underapplied. If it were the other way around and actual were less than applied, it means we applied too much. This would be less than zero. We over applied. So this is it. Now we're under applied by 112,750. What do we do with that? We're going to see what we do with that in some of the problems coming up. Exercise 5.4 will get us through learning objective number four. Prepare journal entries. Ugh, you say journal entries. Lancaster Company recorded the following transactions for the just completed month and we have four of them. I won't read them now. Required, record the above transactions in journal entries. And we can see that we're dealing with raw materials and work in process, direct labor, all of that stuff. So it may be worth uh, sort of repeating our little cheat sheet that we developed before. And remember now, purchases, all purchases flow into raw materials inventory. That's why the arrow goes in. Raw materials inventory flows into work in process and to manufacturing overhead. When it flows in the work in process, we call it direct materials. When it flows in the manufacturing overhead, we call it indirect materials. Our labor, any labor we incur, flows into work in process and flows in the manufacturing overhead. When it flows in the work in process, it's called direct labor. When it flows in the manufacturing overhead, it's called indirect labor. And finally, our last one, manufacturing overhead, also flows into work in process. And in job costing, when it does that, we say that it is applied to work in process, right? Work in process then flows into the finished goods inventory. We call that cost of goods manufactured. From finished goods inventory, we make sales. And this, this amount that flows out is called the cost of goods sold. That's a little cheat sheet that we developed. So all we have to do now is follow the arrows. If you can remember this, whenever you ask for journal entries, if you can rewrite this little flow chart, watch how simple the journal entries are going to become. So number A, 45,000 in raw materials was purchased on account. Well, purchases go into what? Go into raw materials inventory. So if it goes in, it must increase. So raw materials inventory is increased by 45,000. And remember now, we said this before, all of this stuff over here, Anything that happens in here must happen in a balance sheet account. It must. So we need a, an offsetting balance sheet account. So we'll just use accounts payable. Accounts payable for 45000 There we go. Right? There's A. So let's have a look at what B is asking us for. 125000 in raw materials was requisitioned for use in production. So we're over here on this chart. 125 is leaving raw materials. Now we can see that it can leave two ways. It can leave as direct or indirect. Let's see what happens here. Of this amount, 70,000 was for direct materials and the remainder was for indirect. Okay, so when raw materials is leaving, it means it's going into something. 70,000 was direct, so it goes into work in process. So work in process must increase by 70,000. Raw materials was 125, so now we're missing 55. We're told the other is indirect. Well, if we follow this error, it goes in to manufacturing overhead, which increases manufacturing overhead by 55. And since it's leaving raw materials, it must decrease raw materials by 125,000. All I'm doing is I'm following the arrows. Wherever the arrow points to is a debit. Wherever the arrow leaves from is a credit, right? Let's do our next one, C. Total labor wages of 212,000 were incurred. Of this amount, 183 was for direct labor. The remainder was for indirect. Well, if we follow labor, the direct labor goes into work in process. So work in process must increase by, and we're told, 183,000. And the total was 212. So we still have 29,000 to deal with. Indirect labor we see flows into manufacturing overhead for the other 29. And we need something here. 
Now, this is where students often go wrong. They think wages, they put in wages expense, 212. Well, I would say that, the, well, not only is that wrong, I would say that the whole answer is wrong. I wouldn't even give you part marks for getting these two right because as soon as you put an income statement account on here, you miss the whole point. In other words, you haven't got anything. All you're doing is following arrows, but you haven't really learned it. It must be a balance sheet account. So you cannot put wages expense. So you have to come up with something. We'll just put wages payable, right? Wages payable for the difference. But if you put a, an income statement account there, I would be of the thinking that you really, really haven't got this at all. There's no point in even giving you part marks because you probably don't even understand why you did this. You just said, well, I'm just going to follow the arrows. I don't really know if it's right. Because if you put expense here, you don't know. It must be a balance sheet account. So I'm going to draw an arrow here and be very specific. This is a balance sheet account. Balance sheet account. And if we look up here, we see that this also was a balance sheet account. If we're not dealing with one of the raw materials, work, uh, manufacturing overhead, work in process, finished goods, not any, one of the inventory accounts, we have to find a balance sheet account. All right, let's do the last one. I'm boring you, I know that. Additional manufacturing overhead costs of 189000 were incurred. So that means it goes into manufacturing overhead. If these costs were incurred, manufacturing overhead must increase by 189000 and we need an offsetting entry. What's the rule? Must be a balance sheet account. You think, well, what could it be? If you don't know, always use accounts payable. You can't go wrong with accounts payable because it's something you got to pay, so you can always call it accounts payable, 189000 Again, a balance sheet account. And there you go. There's your journal entries.